Hi, I'm Elsa. Today is November 19th, 2024, and I have noticed a change in the way that I answer some AI, generative AI, machine learning, um, data science questions during interviews. And the, the change is because the fundamental way that we use the language to describe the pipelines or what we're doing when we're building AI systems has sort of shifted upwards. So what I mean by that is we have the after LLMs on this side of the screen right here. And then we have the before LLMs. The setup for either before LLMs and after LLMs. So basically before we had chat GPT for the masses that was easy to interact with about a year and a half or two years ago um, versus um, after when we started to use chat GPT and some of us use the API. So the setup for either case is still the same. You still typically use TF-IDF cosine similarity to make embeddings, which is a way to store the data in a more mathematically re represented way that uses a lot of linear algebra and all sorts of mathy things to find the closest set of words. So after TF-IDF cosine similarity um, for embeddings to store inside of a vector database, you then typically use something like k-means clustering. So you put the data into meaningful groups using whatever machine learning you want to use. And then you submit the question. In the past, before we had ChatGPT, we can use a Flask app as the example, right? Or you could have used a web app or whatever. There was a different way to query your own data versus now we use GPT or BERT. So first, right, like we, we set up everything the same way. And so back in the pre-GPT uh, times or the pre-transformer times, when I would talk about train the model or fine tune the model, I was actually, I was describing the machine learning foundational system or the algorithm that I would use to process that data. So it would, the answer to that question would be something like, I picked X, XG boost instead of random forest because X, Y, Z. And then if I was going to change the weights, I would actually go into the, the way that the neural net back propagates, you know, and I would change the weights there. So very much a, if I can compare it in computer science, closer to the operating system of the way that the neural network or the AI system works, right? But now when I'm talking about, when I'm asked, how do you fine tune a model, the answer has to be different because I no longer have to build a model from scratch in the same way. And so this is the big change in the way that that question can be answered. And it's really vital to find out if your interviewer is asking you from the paradigm of the, what I call the old data science, the old machine learning, which is building, you know, apps and web apps and doing this kind of training from the ground up versus now we're going to leverage GPT or BERT, which are the transformer types of LLMs that let us bypass all of the um, limitations of having to search by closer to what are keywords. So with these old apps, you could do things like fuzzy matching, which was the way that you would use cosine um, cosine similarity, sine cosine similarity to figure out what exactly the user was asking about. And it, it was up to the person building this, right, to be able to guess what people would type into the search queries. Well, now that we have transformers, which are GPT and BERT, we can leverage the way that OpenAI or Anthropic or whomever you want to use, Llama, whatever you want to use, the way that they have trained their models on massive, massive, massive amounts of text data so that you no longer have to worry about things like fuzzy matching with the context of the way vocabulary is used, right? So like now when I am asked about fine tuning a model, well, there's a way to fine tune models, but without having to build from scratch. So if I'm going to fine tune a model, now what I would answer is if I am um, using proprietary data, right? Or a very specific data set, that is um, like critical to the company or critical to the project and 
and I and I need to obfuscate it so that I'm not accidentally exposing it to the API. There's some stuff that I can do, but for the purposes of explaining how the pipeline works from beginning to end, I now when I fine tune the model, I can use static file tuning which means that I would upload an example of a key value pair, probably in JSON format, to the LLM or to the API or to the, in, in the OpenAI example, um, to the, into the playground, I could use it in the playground, that has the likely query and then the desired outcome so that the model is now, all, it's still changing the weights, but it's doing it from this level versus over here, I was literally changing numbers around, but I can still do that, right? So the so the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna leverage the language system that is has already been trained on. So that's the big, uh, I guess, savings of effort and energy is trying to guess what a potential user, particularly in things like a chat bot, or if I have a company with a ton of documentation, I no longer have to try to guess what keywords people would be using to search with. Right? Now, now people can ask in their own natural language and other languages, like there's so much more flexibility now. So now I can focus on fine tuning based on my very specific um, um, data set that is more like the uh, knowledge expert, right? So I can fine tune by uploading this, this type of file. Or I can also do, um, and I can, not or, but and, I can also do reinforcement learning where a human says like, this, this was good, this was bad, and then it penalizes answers that were undesirable. So the LLM learns from that level up. So the LLM can make distinctions based on the um, curated data set, right? Versus having to account for the way people are searching with the way that they use natural language. And I can also change the weights if I am accessing the API by changing parameters that used to be a little bit less evident, I feel, over here. But here now with, for example, the OpenAI API, I can change top K, top P, and temperature. And those mean different things. I have another video where I go into that, but essentially um, top K is a set of answers that is a very specific number of answers that are the top answers for whatever the query is, right? And then my system picks from there, or I can use top P, which is more of a uh, dynamic way of searching, which accounts for the distribution of the data as a mass throughout my potential responses so that it picks the very best one out of whatever Right, so it's more dynamic, it, it makes better decisions, it's usually a better solution. And I can change the temperature. So the higher the temperature, the more creative the answer, the lower the temperature, the less creative answer. So I can still change those and those are a way to change what some of us call the weights. What I can do, what I would do then is I would um, be able to do all of this without having to create the model from scratch. However, I can still, if you see these green arrows pointing this way, I, I can change the weights so that my natural language answers are tuned in this way, right? And this way I can make sure that I have what some of us would call a set of guardrails, right? So there are certain types of answers that I would not wanna give. So I can include that in either of these systems by either telling it this is the only type of answer or this is the kind of answer I want you to give for this type of question, or I can, penalize it when it gives an answer that is undesirable, right? That's one way to tune the model or tra train the model, right? So now when I talk about training the model, I'm not necessarily talking about letting it run for hours and then I sit there and watch it happen, which, which I still can do. So after I do this, this is one layer of what I can do. And then if I still have like the domain expert set of data, I can then I can go ahead and still with that expert set of data, either at this point or even before I do this, I can still apply the old style machine learning, data science-y kinds of stuff, you know, where I would decide what type of algorithm to put the data through. Um, I could mess with the weights, I could fine tune the model there. Um, and then 
in the end, whatever compilation of different methods I decide to put together so that I come up with the best um, accuracy, the best uh, um, reliability, you know, depending on what my use case is, my metrics won't be the same every time. So it just because sometimes I'm looking for accuracy doesn't mean I'm always going to look for accuracy, right? It just depends on what it is that you're your goal is, especially business intelligence goals, like they're different across different use cases. So depending on that, I would, I would still be able to do all of that. And then after subjecting my data to either system or the combination of these systems or both of these systems or whatever the design is, then I would still suggest pickling the data so that I further obfuscate any proprietary data. And then I would feed that to the model and in this case over here on the right hand side, when I say feed it to the model, I'm talking about the lower level building, you know, the flask gap from the ground up. But if I'm talking about GPT, right, like for, through OpenAI, then when I say feed the pickle data to the model, then I put it into the vector database that is available through the OpenAI API, or I can put it into a pinecone database, whatever type of database. And that's what I mean by feed it to the model in that case. And then the LLM is actually querying this pickled data, which is the machine learning result of all the stuff I did. So it can get really convoluted. So to explain this, uh, when I'm doing interview questions, it's really, it, it's really critical to ask the interviewer questions that help drive the answer. Um, because depending on how up, up to par the interviewer is on the latest and greatest in any of these APIs, and it, it's hard to expect anybody to know what's happening across all of the APIs, like through all of the different, you know, systems. So I, I think what I've seen is, um, and I've also heard it anecdotally from others, that it's becoming a little bit harder to know that everyone's talking about the same thing, which is not a surprise, but it's also something to keep in mind. Um, you know, and, and the typical, what would you call it? Like the typical job description says that they want somebody that understands how to use RAG. Well, um, retrieval augmented generation, it means that it's not really coming up with content. It just means that it has a, like, for example, an encyclopedia set of information. And then you build something that knows how to go fetch the data and give it back to you. Um, and your goal would be to minimize hallucinations. Right. So that's, for example, if I have um, my standard operating procedures and my my employees want to find information quickly, then then that's what I would do. And then the G, the GPT type of open, for example, OpenAI API, or even the way I would use Claude, uh, is more for when I'm doing predictive analysis or when I have sparse data and I need to be able to predict what the data would have been, right? Or when I want to create content, like creative content. So when I see the job descriptions, I, you know, it's, it's hard to know how literal they are and who actually wrote the job description and if they know the distinction between those two. And I, it took me a good minute to make sure that I was really clear on, on this is when we say fine tune the model, well, which, which part of the model? And are we talking about, you know, a model that's leveraging the AI system for that's already been trained on language data or are we talking in ground up or whatever, right? And it, and it really depends. I mean, some some opportunities for different entries are for building the entire pipeline. Some things are for working on a specific scope. And all this leads to why I keep saying that AGI is is just a, a mirage, like because it there, it's hard for me to to not see it as close to AGI, right? I call it baby AGI, but this is a fundamental building blocks that I think if you're kind of like mostly just data science or you're just mostly computer science or you don't know how you don't know how automation works on the back end, right? Then it's hard to envision it. But I think it's because I have this combination, right? That I'm able to not just see it, but implement it over and over again through across different things, right? And so the next step during an interview has been, well, are you trying to implement AI? Or are you trying to implement AI automation? Because if I just have one, one simple thing I'm doing with one data set, right? Then I'm probably just looking for AI or machine learning. 
However, if I am trying to scale my company and I'm trying to, or even if I'm trying to optimize, or I have a lot of data and I'm not sure what to do with it, or I have very little data, so I don't even know if I can do anything with it. Well, then what I want to do is I want to use AI and automation and probably machine learning. So these are what I put into the bucket of agents. It, that's my description, right? There, I mean, these terms are so new and it depends on who you ask. And if I ask one researcher versus read another paper, they're going to have different answers. But in the end, the Venn diagram, in my opinion, is like where the true solution lies. So what do all of them have in common? Well, they can all optimize and they can all scale and they can all either generate information or they can go fetch information really well. Right. And, and we no longer have to worry about the way that people ask questions because we have LLMs, which are large language models, right? Like literally, to, literally, that's what they mean. They, they basically relieve us of the burden of trying to guess the way that people might search for what we're looking for. And they relieve people like me that are not just English speakers, but uh, simultaneous bilinguals or um, second language learners or English as a language learners. And I don't know the PC terms at this point in time. I haven't been a teacher for a while, but um, basically like we no longer have to try to guess the way that someone that speaks only English as their first and only language would have phrased a question you know, and, and hope that we get it right. So when I have these agents that are the AI with the automation, with the machine learning, right? And the machine learning is what makes sure that I am able to obfuscate my data to a degree because I can pickle the data. And then it's very specialized. So it's got the domain specific knowledge in it. So I can basically talk to a, a, a document or a, a system, right? Or a an agent. So it's an agent. So I can talk to the, the data as if it was the expert that I had in front of me. And that's like a, that's like a kind of a mind twisting thing, right? So I'm basically able to talk to my data as if I was asking the person that is the domain expert. So you combine these three things together, that's what I call an agent, right? And then when I have agents, multiple agents, so if I have in my company, right, an agent that is in charge of the standard operating procedures. And then I have another agent that is in charge of incoming clients. And then I have another agent that is in charge of the way that I retrieve records from my database. And I have another one that is in charge of the billing processes, right? Then what I have when I combine them are even more advanced sophisticated reasoners. So already, you know, if you if you think about this in terms of psychology, the fact that these three things combined are already a very sophisticated way of coming up with the best answer for the user that is asking the questions. To me, that's a very blurry line between, well, is this just some type of agent or is this already like something that is able to reason and make decisions? Right. So like, so, so I would call these decision makers, right? Agents, decision makers. Then if I am able to combine the agent for each of these different departments in my company, right? And they can talk to each other and make decisions based on whatever data they need. Then they're already making choices that affect other systems. So they're able to make sure that whatever solution, and by solution, I mean whatever the output is or whatever they do is taking into account the greater whole. And is this possible? It's, yeah, like there, this is nothing new. This is automate. So then this is where the automation is really helpful because if, if you're um, good enough at abstracting the different functions that the system can take, which inside of the, for example, the OpenAI API calls them actions, Right or in other words, think and visualize it as like somebody pressing the enter key or pressing your mouse and making things happen. You can you we've been uh, programming our operating systems to do stuff to do stuff for us for years, like many years. Like I I can't think of a time when it was impossible to um, get your operating system to do stuff. So now you have this these agents that are working together as reasoners to make intelligent decisions, and then you can give them permission to click buttons on your laptop. And most recently, now that we're uh, moving into more, uh, I mean, it didn't have to be cryptocurrency. You really could just set up your PayPal to like, you know, 
give it permissions to press buttons. Like that's that's your operating system. You, you're you're able to do that. Um, so but now you're able to allow it to make decisions. Um, and that is what leads to innovators. And then when you have things that are doing this, then then it really can't run on its own as a full organization. So when people talk about like, oh, AGI is not real, you know, oh, it's just like a, something that's going to happen in 10 years. I, I don't see the big distinction uh, between what whatever people end up deciding is AGI and something that can do a lot of stuff for you already. So for me, it's more like, like if, if I'm going to get hit by a car, <laughs> I'm not going to stop there and try to figure out what year, make and model the car is, right? I'm just going to get the hell out of the way because why would I care about that when there's such a bigger forest to see and not not get lost in not being able to see the forest from the trees? That's that's all I'm trying to say is like who cares what you call it? Like the fact is that there are some of us that are already building this stuff for for our own purposes. And when I hear uh, a lot of people talk about um, all these employees are leaving open AI, well, so would I. If I saw the potential in this, I'd be like, see ya, and then. And then, you know, of course I would be like, oh yeah, that's a little bit scary that it can really outperform me. It would be like if if Michael Jordan showed up on the basketball court and then suddenly there's a robot that can jump, you know, like and touch the moon and then, you know, come back on the ground and, and dunk the ball. Like it, it's kind of like that. Of course it would be like a little bit intimidating, you know, and the ego must die in that, that case, right? Like you have to, you really have to do some internal work. Like there, there's, and there, it's nothing new to be at a, at a tech company and then learn enough stuff to, you know, if you're creative enough, go build something and then, you know, let, let it make you money and then go back to work and learn something else somewhere else. Well, that, the thing you built made you money. Like there's nothing new about that or strange. Um, it's like if I work at McDonald's and then I go open a restaurant, well, I learned how to, how to run restaurants. So I should be better at running restaurants. Right? It's very similar. These are the kinds of questions that I, I have been running into in interviews. And then even as I develop my own system, just kind of coming full circle, um, seeing the differences and how the question set has different answers now and how the way we use things that used to be crystal clear um, for asking questions or transmitting information have evolved. Now that the way that we use this, te this technology um, evolved. And that is my two cents on the, the shift in how how uh, interview questions and pipelines for optimization and scalability have really changed. And that's what is so exciting is that now that we have all these processes in place, you know, people that are not needing to be convinced when they see more data, but kind of understand fundamentally what, what it means, like what we're seeing means. Um, we'll jump on the bandwagon, right? And just basically like when people told you to buy Bitcoin when nobody believed in Bitcoin, I feel like this is that stage where, you know, people have talked about how Bitcoin is a scam and it's a, it's it's nothing but hype, right? Um, but my undergrad was on Bitcoin and like I could see it in the math that, th that it it basically like leveled out, like it, not leveled out, sorry, it, it basically like panned out. Like it, there there was nothing, there was no discrepancy in the science or the math behind it which I can't say for other cryptocurrencies. So then, yeah, like like at that time, which was a while ago, like Bitcoin was a good idea, right? So kind of same thing here. So I specialize in SEO um, and not not traditional SEO because I really think that there is a, an enormous change in the way that we're going to see the way search engines works. And there's a lot of regulations and Trump just passed new regulations and the EU AI regulations might affect all of us, you know, blah, blah. There's so much stuff happening that you have to account for. Uh, but I, I do um, think that anything that wants to be found on the, in the digital landscape will be more findable more easily if you kind of uh, trust the systems and just evolve and roll with the punches as the stuff starts getting rolled out. And um, if you're interested, like, please message me on LinkedIn. That's the best way to find me. I really like building these kinds of automation systems for businesses. And um, I believe that the supporting local businesses is really, really where the fun in life is. And yeah, uh, find me on LinkedIn if you're, if you want to learn more or if you have a specific business idea, I'll, there, there, the sky's the limit. There's nothing that cannot 
There's, I haven't found a single thing that doesn't benefit from the correct usage of, I'm not going to say correct, but like, but a, but a good enough usage of the power of AI through the LMs. And that's why I hope that, you know, more people start using it and people see the value in, in allowing us access to it with fewer restrictions. Um, because, because there are people like me that are, you know, like making sure that the, uh, benefits of AI can be shared by all. You just have, you just have to like know who to ask and, and, and understand that it's, it's new. So, you know, it's like, we're all, we're all getting to build now. We all get to build now. And speaking of, I'm going to go build some more stuff. Thanks for watching.